Hello everybody in Zoom, and hello by everybody in Facebook live stream land on the Isle Rock group. I don't know who's here with us yet. Uh, looks like we're up and running. Well, if you can hear me, let me know. Kia, you hear me out there? Loud and clear. Okay, yeah, you're pretty loud and clear. Would you give me a check, one, two, three? Check, one, two, three. Check, one, two, three. Now that's good. Thank you. Uh, okay. We're getting close. We're getting close. And I'm now going to the Facebook page so I can check comments if need be. I'll have to turn off my volume there. You like my pearls, Kia? And I'm now going to the Facebook page. You like my pearls? I do. <laughs> Aren't they nice. lovely? You want to check that one more time for me, please? Sure. I just I had to move it again. It looks crooked to me. And don't touch. Oh no 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 no. Was it, it was too, too low? Mm -hmm. Okay okay. Pull it on up a little bit. Is it any better? Yeah, it's right at the top though. It, it, it looks good. It looks good to me. I like what I'm seeing on the screen. Okay, what, one more. Just leave it alone for one second. Let's see what happens. Okay, that's just that's just not even close. That's too far. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. You snap. Okay. Look at it on the screen now and see what it looks like. Mhm. Mm yeah, looks fine. Let me see if my head's chopped off. I hope it won't be. Let's see what it looks like when I sit myself down. Yes, this is good. Okay. Okay, and now I'm gonna go to oh, the slideshow and Gina. I, are you letting Gene in? Yeah. Okay. All right, and I don't want this to be, I wanna minimize this just a little bit. Uh, it escaped. Okay, and then I need to, not have that up. I need to have that up. Nope, not that. Not that. This. Okay, okay, okay. That's looking good. All right, I think I'm ready. Hey, Gino. What's up? Oh, not much, man. You sound real good coming through that uh, speaker. Give me a test one, two, three. Four storms seven years ago. <laughs> Are we at Disney World? Was that the Hall of Presidents? I don't know what that is. I'm not sure what I'm that was. I'm hearing a deep, 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 it's rounded voice. No. I've been working on... It's a small world <laughs> Please, it's going to be in my head all week. Jean, please. <laughs> it's a small world it's not going to get out of my head now. Okay, now that you've done that, I've been, I, I don't know if I can do it right now, but I've been working on my, you know, really uh, low, whispery Clint Eastwood thing, you know? I tell Patricia all the time, I'm just going to keep talking like this all the time. Uh, and I tell her... Get down low. <laughs> Go ahead, punk. Just, just think, just day. say that you did, and please don't. <laughs> just say that you did. <laughs> okay, are y'all ready to go? Yo, Lord... All right, you ready? You ready. Okay, so we have uh, a task before us tonight, and here's the question. I'm holding it up for you Facebook people because you don't see my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is there someone named Satan in the New Testament? Now, before you say, oh my gosh, Bert's run off the rails, you might want to remember, or if you haven't seen it, go back and look at some of the things that we did on Satan in the Old Testament, and we did not find him there. I bet so, he's in the new. we're looking for the new, and the question is, is Satan someone's name in the New Testament? And that's the, that's, the, that's the church lady, by the way. You, what were you about to say? I'm going to put $5 on it that uh, it is there in the New Testament. Anybody want to take Patricia up on a $5 bet that Satan is a name of someone in the New Testament? It's there. It's got to be there. Okay, good. Glad to hear that. <laughs> we don't have to do the study now. 
<laughs> so here we go. Next slide, please. Okay. And we have here. Sorry. Okay. So, Satanas means adversary. This is in the Koine Greek, the original language of our New Testament, probably. Although there are some theories from some schools in Jerusalem, and I have friends who have studied under those guys over there, and they think that the Gospels might have been written originally in Hebrew, but then quickly translated into Greek, and we don't have any remaining Hebrew copies. That's just a theory. It works well with parables, by the way, so it may be true, but as far as we know, the original uh, Greek, uh, Koine Greek is the original language of the New Testament, Satanas which is usually translated Satan, means adversary. I want you to know that in the New Testament, that word appears in the Greek New Testament, in the Greek, not English. <clears throat> this is not a translation. In the original Greek, it appears 35 times in 33 verses. And as you can see, that includes quite a number of books of the New Testament. Uh, the most occurrences are in Revelation. We don't need to look at that, though. We're going to focus on the Gospels, because that's where we can really dig into the Word. The word satanas, meaning adversary. So here we go into the Gospels. Satanas in the four Gospels. We have 16 times that it occurs in 14 verses. You got it? That's not very many times, but that's how many times it occurs in the Gospels. Just four times in Matthew, six times in Mark, five times in John, and one time in Luke. I mean, um, in five in John, Luke, and one time in John. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's look at let's look at a um, the only encounter where this person we call Satan has some speaking lines, right? Mm -hmm. And do you know what story that is? Where Satan actually talks with Jesus? Well, he was tempted, and Jesus was tempted of the devil. Absolutely. There you go. So Jesus was tempted by. Ha diabolos. That means the slanderer. It's almost always translated as the devil. That's for next week. We're going to look at the term the devil. Now, if you look at the black up here, okay, I wanted to point out first that Mark does include a brief mention of Jesus being tempted. But as you can see, it's very short, just a couple of verses. And all it says is that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was there 40 days. He was tempted by Satan, and the angels waited on him. So we'll come back to that in just a second. Let's focus on Matthew and Luke, because these give us the fuller version of the story. And they're a little bit different, but, but in many ways, pretty close. On the left, you see that Matthew uh, 4, 1 through 2, says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the it's devil. translated the devil. Of course, that's in Greek, that's ha diabolos, and it means the slanderer. We'll get to the devil part later. That's next week. But they use that term, let's, let's just use it for now, the devil. They use the term the devil uh, pretty liberally. Next one. But then Matthew makes a little shift right there in the next verses, calling him the tempter, while Luke sticks with the devil. So the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God. Mm -hmm. It's the same temptation, it's just that Matthew swapped up and used the tempter once instead mm -hmm. of the devil, which gives us an idea of how Matthew viewed the devil as a tempter. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a story about Jesus's temptations so right. that makes some sense maybe a little overdone maybe a little redundant but certainly clear as the story goes on notice that Matthew uh, continues to call goes back to calling him the devil and Luke just uses the word he in those nine let's nine ten eleven in those four verses he just says he and him all right and here's where it gets interesting check it out Matthew sticks with the devil. Luke sticks with the devil. Uh, if you look at Matthew 4, 8, and again, the devil <clears throat> took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Luke puts it like this. Then he led him up and showed him an instant all the kingdoms of the world. 
And the devil said to him, all right, but notice where Satan comes in right here. Jesus says, away with you. It's translated here in the new revised standard. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Uh, notice that in Luke, the name Satan, translated the name Satan, is yeah. never used. Mm -mm. Never used. And this is the final verse of Jesus' temptations. And there he is sitting there lonely and hungry and tempted. Okay. Matthew 11, uh, 4.11 says, Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Luke says, When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. That sounds very much like Luke, doesn't it, Gene? So let's go back to Mark's briefer version and take a little closer work look because it also has the word Satanas in it. Satanas, uh, how Satanas is the adversary. Okay, this verse reads, And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. I want you to notice that in this translation, this is the Revised Standard, it has three words for tempted by Satan. Tempted by Satan. Now look in the original Greek. It's four words. And uh, those words are perizomenon or perizomenos, hupo to satana. All right? That means tempted by the adversary. So what motivates someone to translate like this when it's actually like this you know what you have to do you have to completely ignore a word that's in your bible you have to throw it out you have to toss it in the garbage you have to reject it you have to drop it you have to drop in that entire word right there the which is an important word because it tells you it can't be a proper name mm -hmm. if it's the something mm -hmm. it's not somebody's name it's mm -hmm. just a common noun like the farmer mm -hmm. okay so uh, you have to drop the V, then you have to drop the last letter of the word Satana, and then you have to change the S to a capital. Now, why did they do that? That's our question tonight. Why did they do that? Why did they turn this into a proper name? They're, they're actually jettisoning a word from your Bible, and they're changing one of the words into a proper noun. And I can, you know, I wanted to know why, and I can tell you why, but we got to get there first. Look at this. Here's Jesus suffering in the Judean wilderness. It's a, I like this painting. It's uh, actually pretty realistic. That's pretty much what it looks like out there. So, again, let's go back to Matthew 10. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, in all 24 translations into English, but one that I looked at, 24! 24, 23 of them said, turned Satanas into the proper noun, into the name Satan. And the, to do that, they had to not translate Satanas. They had to drop the last two letters in Satanas, and they had to capitalize the first letter S to do it. That's a lot of rigmarole that seems unnecessary to me and misleading. One translation out of 24 Young's literal translation reads, And then saith Jesus to him, Go, adversary, for it hath been written, The Lord thy God thou shalt bow to, and him only thou shalt serve. Young's literal translation re renders Satanas as adversary. Why is adversary capitalized? I don't know. If not capitalized, the meaning is exactly the same. The one called the tempter and the slanderer is also the adversary, or an adversary. You following me? Mm -hmm. Okay, check it out. Next slide. Okay, in the Gospels, right? Only three of 14 verses in the Gospels contain Satanas without the definite article the in front of it. Just Satanas alone without the the. And here they are. It's the one you just looked at. Away with you, Satanas. Okay? 
which we can translate adversary, or you can go through all that gymnastics that the other translators went through and turn it into a proper noun. All right. Matthew 16, 23, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Does that sound familiar? It's the same. Actually, in the Greek, it's the same words he said to, to uh, Satana, the adversary in the wilderness during the temptations, right? Mm -hmm. So get behind me, Satanas. You are a stumbling block to me, for you're, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then in Mark 8, 33, but turning to his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satana, Satanas, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, I have a question for you, and it's at the bottom of this page. The next slide replaces the proper noun Satan with its translation, adversary. Let's see whether adversary works. You want to bet? <laughs> next slide. Jesus said to him, away with you, adversary. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, adversary. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So if you are, an, if you are a proponent, a supporter of things that are not divine, then you are an adversary to God. In other words... Jesus actually defines what the word means, confirming that that's how it should be translated. An adversary would be someone who has their mind on human things, not heavenly things, not God's things. So that's what adversary means. The last one is the same. Uh, get behind me, adversary, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Does the sentence work? Do these three sentences work when Satanas is translated accurately as adversary? They work perfectly. Not only do they work perfectly, but Jesus defines what adversary means in the next sentence in two of them. And if you don't worship the Lord your God, you're his adversary in the first one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's keep looking at this. Let's, let's see if we can figure this out. So, the remaining 11 of those 14, you can see both, um, uh, below here. here. Here are the other 11. And they all have the in front of them, but they all in this in these translations, except for one, capitalize the S and drop the V. But it literally says, I'll just say them real quickly, the Satan tempts Jesus, which would be the adversary. The Satan will sift Peter. The Satan entered Judas. In the fourth one, John says something similar about Satan entering Judas. The next ones, five, six, seven, and eight. In uh, one, two, three different Gospels, if the Satan casts out the Satan, in other words, if the adversary casts out the adversary, that's that thing about Beelzebub, remember? Mm -hmm. And then number nine is a woman bound 18 years by the adversary, the Satan. The adversary or the Satan in the parable of the sower is uh, mentioned, and uh, he says late in uh, Luke's Gospel, I watched the Satan fall like lightning. I watch the adversary fall like lightning. Okay, so get this over here in the pink. Every one of these reads in Greek the Satanas, which means in English the adversary. Let's see if the adversary works in each of these verses. I'm not going to read them all, but here they are, and it works perfectly fine. For example, the first one He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by the adversary. Uh, look at number five. If the adversary casts out the adversary, he is divided against himself. Uh, number six. Jesus spoke to them in parables. How can the adversary cast out the adversary? Number seven. And if the adversary has risen up against himself, he cannot stand. Get it? Mm -hmm. it they all say the satanas, ha satanas, which is translated from Greek into English accurately as the adversary. You could also use synonyms for adversary like opponent or enemy, but it's more commonly, the, the, the predominant meaning is often given the adversary, including in Young's literal translation into English. Well, what about the rest of the New Testament? Not the Gospels, the rest of the New Testament. Look at this. These are the remaining, these are the remaining times that the Satanas, the adversary, appears in the New Testament. 
And guess what? Every single one of them but one, all the translators translate as capital S-A-T-A-N, the proper noun, the name Satan. But all of them say the Satanas, the adversary. Every single one of them but one. And we've got one weird exception that I knew you would want to see. Give me one sec to show you that. This is a unique case I found in all of the New Testament where when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 12, 7, let me tell you what, he writes well. And in this sentence, I think in Greek, it, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> the problem is, is that, as you'll see, there are very few articles and there are very few prepositions. Look at this, look at this first, at this Greek phrase, which reads, Edotha, Moiskopos, Tasarki, Angelo Satana, which literally reads, was given me thorn the flesh messenger adversary. That doesn't sound like a sentence. Mm -mm. It's missing a ton of prepositions like of or from, and it's missing articles like the or a. So here we go at the bottom. In the New Testament, apart from the Gospels, only here in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 do we find the word satanas without the article the in front of it. But also, scops and angelos lack the usual the in front of them. It's not the only word where the article is missing or the, or the preposition is missing. So these words require the addition of articles and or prepositions, but which ones? What are the choices? Well, guess what? For this phrase, for, this, for these two words, angelos, satana, there are 16 choices, and there they are. I put them as four but you, as you can see, you can choose an angel of Satan, or you can choose the angel of Satan. You can choose an angel, the angel of Satan, or you can choose from Satan. So each one of these represents four different options, considering four different prepositional ways of putting it together. So which would you choose? Well, guess what? I can show you what the 24 English translations that I looked at chose. Right here, 10 of them chose a messenger of Satan. Three of them chose a messenger from Satan. Only one chose adversary, chose to translate the word, as I showed you before, Young's literal translation. A messenger of the adversary. The next one is six of them chose the messenger of Satan. One chose, unbelievably, one sent from Satan, completely ignoring the word angelos, and an angel of Satan for two of them, and the angel of Satan for one of them. That's 23 out of 24. Look, 23 chose the proper name Satan, and only one chose to translate the Greek, the adversary. I'm still asking why. We're getting there, though. So take a look at this. Here's the Greek phrase. And I'm going to tell you what these Greek words mean one at a time in order, literally. They mean, was given me thorn the flesh, messenger adversary, to beat, to me beat, so that not self-exalt. Are you picking up which quote this is about Paul's thorn in the flesh? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Yes. All right. So here's my translation, which I love, of course. I was given a thorn in the flesh, Paul writes, a messenger of the adversary, stabbing at me in order that my ego not overinflate. This is Young's literal translation. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of the adversary, to buffet me that I might not be exalted over much. Get it? Mm -hmm. The only reason that I used stabbing and uh, not overinflate is because the word, that word means Beat, you know, it means buffet, it means pummel. This word up here means pummel or um, bash repeatedly. But um, since the thorn is the thing that's doing the hitting, thorns poke or stab. So mm -hmm. I changed it to stabbing instead of punching. So that the ego not overinflate, which I thought was a nice twist on that too. Mm. So you get it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> yes. With the word, um, you know, like when a thorn pricks you, 
Would that work as a possible translation? It may be too literal. But I didn't look it up. I don't know. Just the thought, you know, being pricked by a thorn. Yeah, if you were pricked by a thorn, you know, a, a needle will punch through yeah. your skin. And he's, and the word means punch. So I just took, see, that's the thing with translations. If you yeah. do it literally sometimes, it doesn't make as much sense as if you think for a minute about, okay, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about thorns. Well, thorns don't punch, but they do punch through skin. They do stab. Mm -hmm. So that's why. With a needle. Yeah. Know, or a nail. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Through the skin, like a nail on, on a crucifixion. Yeah, but I never take that to be literal, a thorn in the flesh meaning. That's I mean, correct. Not, not something literal, but some. Yes, sadly, we don't know what was wrong with him. There have been lots of guesses. Yeah, I know. And, and most of the times, um, people talk about um, the flesh <clears throat> meaning um, being sexual. Um, and so he had to go through and prove himself. And this thing keeps bothering him like he couldn't get over it. Like he couldn't get through. He kept yeah. making mistakes. So, you know, I, I, is how he's been any, Yeah, I know. I've heard blindness. I've heard lots of things. Uh, the only hint that we have about it is this verse, which is metaphorical, you know, um, it's a figure, but thorn in the flesh is a way of saying that I've got something wrong. You know, I, I have something physically wrong with me. He said to the church at Galatia, you know, you were aware of my illness, but you were not offended by it. So it wasn't something that made him probably defiled, but it was something that was noticeable that they overlooked. Huh. I never, I never thought of it as physical. I always thought of it as a metaphor, but it's no. something like, let's say I'm trying to stop smoking, just what, you know, just for example. And I kept, I keep using the patch. I'm using this, but like this thorn, this that thing, could be. I or don't know. this, um, you know, maybe addicted addiction to porn or something. Whatever it is, this addiction is like an addiction. Well, it could be an addiction, but it's just based on what I've looked at. I think he had something physically wrong with him. I don't know what it was. He was, maybe his eyes crossed. No, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I mean, he may, he may have had something wrong with his eyes. They may not have focused right. You know, people who have trouble with a crossed eye, people don't know which eye to look into, and it's an awkward situation until you get to know them. I mean, I mean, he said that they weren't offended or thrown by his ailment, whatever it was, but they noticed it. It could have been a, it could have been a speech problem. It could have been, it could have been anything. I mean, he could have limped. He could have had arthritis. We don't know. I don't. <laughs> anything, anything. So, just so that you'll know that I'm not the only person on the planet who has mm. noticed this, I've got three people to show you. Let me show you these two fo folks first. This is scholar G. Richard Hale. He wrote, The word Satan is not a proper noun and therefore should not be capitalized. What did I just say? Mm. If it's got D in front of it, it's not a proper noun. It's like the farmer, the secretary, the tempter, the adversary, okay? It's not a proper noun. Um, according to Lynette Woods, who did a very long uh, article on this, in both Hebrew and Greek, the word Satan, Satan, is not a proper noun, a name. It is a common noun based on a verb that means to oppose or obstruct. So Satan simply means adversary or enemy, someone who stands in opposition against you. In spite of this, almost all English translations treat the word as a name and capitalize it. Only one translation of the Bible, as I told you, Young's literal translation, which she names here, does not have the name Satan in it. Listen to, listen to what she wrote. The name Satan is not in the Young's literal translation Bible at all. It doesn't appear. The name Satan doesn't appear because Young knew to translate it because it had a V in front of it. Okay? So, and he was brave enough to do that against all other, you know, all other translations. We're turning it into a name, Satan, with a capital S. The word is correctly translated into English as enemy or adversary. Instead, if Satan was the actual name of the enemy, it could not have the in the front of it. And who is Lynette yeah. Woods? Um, she's, she's a Christian writer. I, I, don't, I don't actually know what her degree is or anything, but she nailed it. Now, this is my um, friend and colleague. Dr. Tom E. Phillips, whom I contacted yesterday. I just wanted to know what he'd say. So Dr. Tom E. Phillips translated the Gospel of Luke in the new translation called the Common English Bible. Tom and I teach together in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan for the Society of Biblical Studies. 
I messaged him yesterday asking him, and this is a quote, in Mark 118 and elsewhere, to Satanas is translated as Satan with a capital S. Almost all English translations drop the definite article V and capitalize the S, turning the common noun into a name, a proper noun. I asked Tom, what's the justification for translating the adversary as Satan? This is his reply, word for word. No justification. Only tradition. Names do not have an article. It is like the devil. Blessings, my friend. No justification. No scholarly justification whatsoever. They do it because it's tradition. And if you want me to be a little bit skeptical, and I've said this before, it's just like when we talked about Jesus' birth and, you know, what the katalama means. You know, there was no inn. You know, there's no innkeeper. People might not buy your new Bible in the, you know, Christian bookstore if you take the name Satan out. <laughs> now, the devil or the diabolos, um, the tempter, the evil one, the is still there. He just doesn't have a name. He's the adversary. He's called the adversary, the tempter, the slanderer, and the evil one. Those are the four main names. And we're going to look at one of them next week, uh, which is the devil, Diabolos. So here, here's my conclusions, just if you, in case you haven't figured it out yet. In the New Testament, there is a personification of evil called the tempter and the accuser, the Diabolos. And... Um, that is also called the adversary. None of these are names or proper nouns, but are generic titles like the farmer or the secretary. We looked just now, today, tonight, we just looked at every single verse in which Satanas appears in the New Testament, with almost all of them appearing as the Satanas, meaning the adversary. In a few instances where Satanas appears without the the before it, we saw that it is a common noun meaning adversary and nothing justifies translating it as the name or proper noun satan with a capital s in all the rest the satanas means the adversary nothing justifies dropping the article v dropping the as at the end of the word and capitalizing the s at the beginning of the word to render the satanas as the proper noun or name satan therefore in agreement with young's literal translation the name satan does not appear in the new testament I demonstrated in the previous presentations that the name Satan is not in the Old Testament either. My conclusion in agreement with Young's literal translation is that the name Satan is not in the Bible. But guess what? Every English translation you likely have ever read, it's there every time Satanus comes up. Why? It's not scholarship. It's not accuracy. It's tradition. It's what people expect. And the scholars bend to it. And so do the publishers. Discussion. So even though the name Satan may not be there. Yeah. The, the evil one's still there. Yes, that's so. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Like the the evil one, the adversary, the enemy, still the same person. It's just the main. Well, see, that's the question. I think some Christians would say that the evil one is a entity, a being, or a person, some sort of spiritual being. But a lot of other Christians would say that it's a personification of what Jesus said, that all evil comes from the human heart. And that the evil one is a personification of what's really true of us. And that is, in all of us is the evil one. It's in our hearts. It's human fallen sin and evil. So you, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that issue. But that's not up for grabs tonight. I'm, but, you're, but I hear what you're saying. Many people believe in a spiritual entity called the evil one. But his name is not in, We don't know his name. His name's not in the Bible. So, so I hear you. So, okay, let's go back to the temptation of what you mm -hmm. just talked about. So, Jesus was driven up into the wilderness to be tempted of the adversary, by the adversary. And well, actually, the word that's used most often is ha diabolos, which is the slanderer, 
Okay, the slanderer, the liar, the devil, the liar. The, yeah. To be clear, it says that the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Correct. The Holy Spirit drove after his baptism. The Holy Spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tempted, to be tempted by the the um, uh, the slanderer, the liar. So that so in this case then, so if that's true, okay, he was there. This what was the purpose of the slanderer then? To be tempted. Why would the Holy Spirit drive Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary? It's like, it, I think it's this, it sounds like the same thing, even though I, I get the point of the whole teaching tonight around the name Satan. Okay, name, so think know? about it this way. He's just been, he's just been baptized and, and the, the father spoke to him and said, you're my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That's a heavy burden. And he's just about to begin his ministry. And before he begins his ministry, he's got a lot of things going on in terms of his own gifts and powers and how to use them. He's got to get straight. He's got to get straight with God and straight with himself. And he's got to work through these temptations that he's experiencing. And he does so by fasting. He can drink water, but he fasts for 40 days, similar to what you see in terms of 40 days in the wilderness for the 40 years in the wilderness for the Israelite people, for example. So, um, yeah, so he is, uh, this is Jesus's moment of preparation and testing, tempting before starting his ministry. So he's clear on what he's doing. He's absolutely focused on his father's will and his own, um, human desire is not getting in the way. He wants to do God's will. So that was why it was such a hard thing for him. He wasn't just pretending to be troubled out there. He was he was on the break of death. He went to the he went to the wall with his own humanness and human darkness, and he embraced it and he overcame it. Just like he embraced death and overcame that too with resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, this was real. It wasn't. It wasn't. Well, he's acting tested to show us how to do it. He's setting an example, or he's not really being tested. He just wants people to think he is because he wants people to think that he understands their temptations. No. No, he was, the people who have the most strengths are the ones who tend to be tested the hardest. So wait a minute. So, so did you just say that he wasn't tempted? I said he was over and over again just now, I think. Oh, I thought you said he wanted people to know that he wasn't tempted. I was, I was say, giving an example of what one might say if one didn't believe he was tempted. Okay. Tempering his ego a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and a little bit, a bit, a little bit of that. Yeah, human, human desire, hum, human self protection, <clears throat> human agenda. Um, it's just like the, you know, the disciples were all the time trying to tell Jesus what to do, you know, and Jesus had his own mind about things, and so um, Jesus also had his own mind about things in relationship with his being human, and but his father also had a will for him. And he had to come to terms with that. And we all know where that led. It was a bloody mess. That whole confrontation with Peter, when Peter confesses him as Messiah, they get into the argument about defining the term. Absolutely. That's where the second rebuke comes and Peter called the adversary. He says, I'm gonna I'm gonna be arrested, I'm gonna be tortured, and I'm gonna be executed, and on the third day rise. Jesus, rebuke, rebuke. Yeah, yeah. Peter was like, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you over my dead body. And that's when Jesus said, No, you're the adversary now. You're not you, you don't understand God's will in this situation. You need to shut up. How's that five dollars looking now, Patricia? <laughs> it's still on the table. <laughs> you got that bang for five? We can do uh, uh, No, it, no change. I'm not going lower than that. What I'm saying is <laughs> the, the name Satan is not in the Bible. The concept Satan is. Yes. But, yeah. Because it means one who is an adversary, and yeah. in this case, an adversary to what is good, what is right, what is just, which is what is God. Yeah, I mean, I think you made a great case of the name 
And it felt like <laughs> being in English class, you have to know the prepositions and the participle yeah. and, and, and the article and all of those to make sense of what the scripture is actually saying. I mean, I mean, I'm laughing about it, but it, but I mean. Well, I, so the farmer, the farmer's name is Old MacDonald. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not his name's not the farmer. You can refer to him as a the farmer, but it has a little f. But McDonald has a capital M. Mm. McDonald. That's the difference. Well, you, you're the preacher. I'm the preacher, and I'm Bert. Bert's capitalized, and the preacher is not. Yeah. Listen to uh, football players. Uh, if you're missing sales before a Monday night football game, and every once in a while, one of them would say, "The Ohio State University." The, well, pretentious as all get out. Isn't it? Isn't it? You know what? Are you? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this. Um, and what brought to mind was today. I was on a meeting with some seminary students from ITC, and all of them said, kept saying the ITC because it's the theological uh, seminary. The ITC. Uh, the ITC, international or interdenominational. Uh, theological. I guess you could do that with center. any school, it's like the, it's the, not just. But we, you know, we've always said ITC, just ITC. No one says the Emory University. It's just Emory University. But I do hear people say the Candler School of Theology. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on who's the dean. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I mean, how they promote it. It's it's semantics. I don't yeah, know. But I think it makes a difference, though. The 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 the, the or it the does the, change it. Make, it changes the tense of the sentence. It just it changes it. Yep, um, it does. Somebody is giving thumbs up out there on Facebook land, but I uh, I didn't see the comments, so I don't know who it is. It could be Carolyn. I'm not sure. I think it was Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Bolton. Yeah, Carolyn. C I don't know how to pronounce it, Carolyn. Senor. Senor Bolton. Well, Senor. Maybe the G is silent. No, sen no, no, no comprende, Senor. <laughs> Senor, Carolyn, it sounds like it, it, it. She's, she's from Lafayette United Methodist Church. Oh, really? Ah, wow, okay. that's so cool. Hey, Carolyn, I guess I, yeah, I guess we're friends now. Um, I think we friended one another a couple of weeks ago. Well, if, I think she decided she needed a second opinion, and uh, so if you tear it up. she's she's thumbing it up. Welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I put uh, Jackie Chan here saying what I got found a, a meme, and I and I thought, you know, I, we need to acknowledge the fact that this is so absolutely crazy, mind blowing. Mm -hmm. I bet there aren't a handful of people on the planet that know this. I know. I would never before this study. And I suspect that there are millions of people, especially. Um, devout Baptists and Roman Catholics and Baptists and Greek Orthodox and all of the above, especially evangelicals, though, who would mm -hmm. flat out deny this and say, that is not true. Yeah. I just showed that it's true. Mm -hmm. Tell me why it's not instead of tell, calling me names. Yeah. Tell me why it's not. Well, tell me why I'm wrong. I'll listen. I'll listen hard. Yeah. And I'll be respectful if I disagree. And we can agree to disagree. We'd still be friends, still be Christian friends. That's called being mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Carolyn said it was her. <laughs> senior. Hey, 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 senior. Senior. Or senior. Senior. Maybe it's just senior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, Carolyn, senior, Bolton. Senior must be your main name, I presume? Yeah. Yeah. It's spelled really fancy. I, I, um... I'm, I think this study, it alarmed me when Satan, the name Satan wasn't in Job and in anywhere else in the Old Testament. It was like, this is a wake up call because I began to think, well, if in Hebrew it's, you know, ha satan, if, if it's the there, what, mm -hmm. what is it in Greek? Mm -hmm. And I went, I snuck a peek, you know, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and I went, oh no. This, this may happen again, and I really didn't expect it to. I, I meant to find examples where it wasn't true, but I didn't find any. Mm. It's true every single time. So what's the difference with Young's literal translation and all the others? What makes Young stand out from all the, all the rest? 
Well, there are probably a lot of things, and I'm not an expert on, on that translation, though I use it every single day. It's a good one to check out. I have, I have 24 that I check out for any study or sermon that I do. And of course, I, I look at, in addition to that, I look at the Greek or Hebrew and try to do word studies and understand what's going on there. But in Young's literal translation, see, there's a continuum between, in translating between literal and then more, uh, a little bit more relaxed and almost paraphrasical. You know, mm -hmm. and he's way over here in the extreme of literal, which means that when he sees a Greek word, he's going to translate what it means in English. And he's not going to, for any reason, back off of that, whether it's political or theological or ideological or denominational, doesn't matter. He just translates it, what it means into English, the best English word he can apply. Um, obviously, some of our translators almost all of our translators into English, 23 out of 24, decided that they were going to really ignore the actual Greek and put Satan's name in there. And that's bad. It's shocking. How old is Young's? Oh, I don't know. I can tell you if I, I can look real quick. Um, I think I would have, like to have a conversation with him if he's still around. Oh, he's not around. No, no, no. It's it's older than that. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you today. Old, very young. Uh, it was it was first published during the, it was published during the Civil War, eighteen sixty two. Oh my God! It's my grandmother's time. Then they came out with a um, uh, an updated version uh, in eighteen ninety eight. So even the updated version is over a hundred mm -hmm. years to a uh, hundred years old. So. Mm -hmm. Hundred yeah, what would it be? Um, 123 years I need old. To find, I, I know they probably didn't make videos back then, but I'd love to find some or some kind of um anyway. Yeah, it just get me thinking, but that he was he's the only one. Yeah, and, will, and there's that new literal um what's it called? Literal standard version. It's just brand new. It came out just a year or two ago and I checked it and guess what? They capitalized the S, messed up the word and dropped the D. Mm. Now, I think the it, it may be like Tom told me one time when he did that translation um, about no room in the end, that phrase in Luke 2. And I said, well, what did you do with that? And he said, well, of course, I translated the Greek. I, I translated it, um, um, in no, no room for them in the guest room. There was no space for them in the guest room. Or there was no space for them in the living room or whatever it was he translated it as. But the publishers changed it back to no room with the end because they were afraid that the Bible wouldn't sell if it got around to evangelicals. That we <laughs> that it. we had killed the innkeeper and demolished <laughs> the end. There's no in out back, you mean? The, <laughs> with the stable. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so so what, what if you take Satan's name out of a Bible? Will it sell? I mean, it may have been that the guy who translated, the people who... The two groups or scholars who translated all these 23 versions into English, I mean, they may have put the adversary and the publishers changed it back to capital S-A-T-A-N just because that's what people expect and they didn't want bad press in, in the evangelical community. What's his name who said no justification, just tradition? Yeah, that's What's Tom. Tom? Yeah, that's Tom. Yeah, I'll show you him again. I haven't seen him because of COVID. I haven't seen him in over a year, but that's Tom. Hmm. Interesting. I can stop sharing if you like. Okay. That's interesting. Sandra commented on your pearls. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone know why I'm wearing pearls? Tell me later if you don't. I mean, if you think of it. Or tell me now. Kia, you know why I'm wearing pearls? Do you, do you know why I'm wearing pearls, Jean? It is for the Braves. Go Braves! Yay! Go Braves! Go Braves! Go Braves! Yeah, just Braves. supporting the Braves. They've got another game tonight. And Peterson. Yeah, one of yeah. the players. Yeah, Jock, uh, his, uh, his name is, um, Jock. is um, yeah, Jock Peterson. And he is wearing actual real pearls in every game. Mm -hmm. And he won't, tell every, he won't tell anyone why. And all the fans started wearing him because uh -huh. he was on a hot tear a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. he got really popular. 
He has a blonde mohawk and he wears pearls and he hits the ball really, really hard. And now all the um, the media people are wearing them. I saw the news this morning, uh, they were wearing pearls. Yeah, it's the just men and the women. people all over Atlanta are wearing them. Uh -huh. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so um, pearls before swine. <laughs> That's another one we need to get into. I'm yeah. <laughs> Betsy Jean, pearls yeah. before swine. <laughs> No, that's not true. I'm just. Am I that's a bad. Kid. That's a bad joke. That's a bad joke. You know. Um, I'm sorry. You know. You didn't hurt my feelings. I know you're joking. Um, you know. Um, I wish you all would talk to the issue of who do we trust because so many people put their faith and trust in 100% the King James version, and they're scared of everything else. And my experience has been that I'm scared of all of them. You know, I'm looking for the ones that I feel like have been faithful to the original biblical languages. I've got enough tools at my disposal and I've got enough experience and learning at my disposal to know enough about the languages to do that kind of thing, at least in a basic or rudimentary form. I can read it. You know, I know how to pronounce it. I may not be able to translate it without looking up a few things, but I, you know, I just have a feel for it. But most people don't. So they say, well, which which version is the right version? And I'm like, mm -hmm. the one in the original Greek. And even there, we've got multiple copies, sometimes as many as 100 ancient copies of one gospel, like, for example, Mark. And they don't agree word for word in places. So that's why you have scholars who go in there and say, well, what's how do we determine what's most likely what the original copy said? Because we don't have any original copies. We only have copies of of the originals. But you know what I mean, and we've talked about this before, Bert, in, in our culture, we only use the King James Version, mostly. My mom will not read anything other than that, yeah. because anything else is watered down. When you start watered changing, down. it's watered down, yeah. Anything outside of the these and thous, and we want to hear every single word as Jesus said it in the red letters. Well, I mean, I get, I get that in a way. I mean, I like the King James. I like the, I like the feel of the, I like the feel of the King James. I really do. I have a great appreciation for it. I heard it all my life growing up. Um, watered down is an interesting way to put it. Mm -hmm. And so, who do we trust? Well, for your mom. She trusts King James, and she is not going to go anywhere else. No. Um, for me, I've gotten to the point where I don't trust any of them. I trust some a little more than others just based on, you know, road testing them. Which ones more likely than not are, are going to be close to the Greek? And in this case, tonight, it's, it's Young's. Young's was the only one that got it right. Hmm. Out of Rand, of course, got the dilemma after we get the good translation. We've got to contextualize it and understand and translate from Middle Eastern uh, theology and viewpoint and worldview into modern. Yeah, it's a different. It's a different time. Um, uh, it's different culture. Um, yeah, there there are great gulfs between us and those people. I think the best thing that connects us to them is that. Overall, generally speaking, human beings are still the same with some of the same fears and loves and troubles and dilemmas. And, you know, human beings' temperaments and physical challenges are essentially identical going back thousands of years. But the cultures that have grown up, mm -hmm. our cultures are very quite different. And it, it really does help to learn about culture, or culture that particular culture. Um, to help understand what the Bible the Bible is saying, what these writers are saying, and um, one of the ways we do that is by continuing the process of trying to do faithful translations. And I say that with a little bit of tongue in cheek because I'm not I'm not sure any of them right. I, I'm really I'm so blown away by the Satan thing, mm -hmm. and I'm like. Really? Am I stuck with Young's Literal? Is that the only one I can trust? Well, of course it's not, because in, in Young's Literal, there are times when I've found that he, he missed the nuance of the sentence, because he's trying to be too literal, and he missed the joke. Because if you're being too literal, nothing's funny. 
Mm -hmm. So the play on, he misses plays on words. He misses the rhyming sometimes. He misses the cadence, but he, doggone it, did he nail it with these? I mean, it's one against 23. I'll be curious. As he said, golf made me think of the other scripture that says, you know, Father Abraham said last for Sunday, he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, mm -hmm. that for I'm tormented in these flames. Mm -hmm. I will be really curious to hear what that translation says. I just did a whole study on it. Were you here? <laughs> I don't remember that particular verse. The gulf? Oh, it was, the word is uh, chiasmos. It's ca chasm. It means chasm. Canyon. Mm -hmm. Or for, 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 for those, for my Arab, Arabic speaking friends out there, wadi. For my Hebrew speaking friends out there, nahal. Mm. Mm. Wadi rum has anything to do with Yeah, wadi. Yeah, wadi. Kelt, wadi rum. Yeah. Mm. It's what? It's, it, it's hollow, meaning a depression, but they pronounce it holler with an R on the end. Like when I call you Patricia. <laughs> that is my name, Patricia. 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 Have you tried to tell me? Tries to tell me how to call, pronounce my own name, Patricia. Well, well you ain't doing it right. No. <laughs> yeah, and it, it and it's Melissa, and it <laughs> it's Angela. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. So uh, I know I'm. I I wish Kia or you, Jean, would say something about mm -hmm. trust because it's it really weirded me out. What well, this this study it just weirded me out so bad and I I feel like if 23 out of 24 translators are just gonna flat out mistranslate something on purpose because the publisher said they had to something's mm -hmm. just wrong I mean it's like fake news mm -hmm. mm. how do you how, who do you trust in the news well this is a similar question who do you trust amongst the scholars and translators, and then they are dependent upon and overruled sometimes by the publishers. So who, who, who and what, I mean, is this so corrupt now that we can't trust any translation anymore? You know, I'm overstating it, but it really, in this particular situation, really 23 to one? Not good. What are you thinking, Jane? So much for the majority rule. Right yeah, if they took a vote, Young's literal translation, which is correct, would lose badly, badly in a landslide. A camel is a horse designed by a committee, <laughs> and an elephant is a mouse built for government space. Oh, yeah, getting a lot of... uh. So what are we? So what are we to do? You know, we it's it, my limited Greek and Hebrew stuff. Um, yeah, who do I read? What do I do? Uh, I listen to Bert Gary on this. I, what else? <laughs> um, and, and my folks are trying to follow me. Yeah. Have you ever done this study and seen this before? A little bit. Um, and, and that's why when you just, you know, somebody says, do you believe in Satan? Um, you know, the first thing that goes through my head is trap. That's a trap question. Yeah. Because my answer is no, not the way you do it, not with a capital S. Yeah. But yeah. most people aren't going to give you the time to explain that. Nope. You know, do you believe in hell? Yeah, it's the most same problem. Okay, so hell. which which word mistranslated as hell do you want to work on? The yeah. one in he the one in Hebrew or the three in Greek? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. the one in DC. Um, you know, what <laughs> and with it's like I said something about Sunday morning. It took 12, 13 minutes to try to summarize uh, Go. Well, that's hard. You know, we, we, you know we're going to try to do this in a sermon. That's not going to work. You're going to have to do ground up study, and you're going to get 5% of your, your Sunday morning crowd to the study, and then think, okay, now how do I explain it to the other 95%? Mm. You know what? And I think, too, I mean, the, these Bible studies have been so meaningful. I, I thought on Sunday, I almost stopped you during your sermon and asked you a question. <laughs> really? Yes. 
it was like when I was talking about evil yes I mean it was a really great sermon but I had a question and I a comment I don't remember maybe when I thought uh, this is inappropriate but I, I wish I yeah I just I thought about it um, but that's why I like these studies so much because you can ask questions and disagree and I mean, you can also disagree with preachers as they preach, um, but it, it's a different thing. But getting your having your questions answered right right away, or um, hearing another take, or well, I well I assumed that meant something else, and to hear, well, well, let's look at this. And I mean, you did a really good job tonight with laying it out. Um, there was no doubt that it's not there. I mean, the way that you did it. Well, if it hadn't, but, but, I mean, the, the the facts are, it was clearer than any other, it just was clearer. Mm -hmm. It was just clearer than it, most mm -hmm. of the other studies in terms of just getting mm -hmm. to the meaning mm -hmm. and to what was going on in terms of hell or Satan. Mm -hmm. We've looked at both. Um, and of course, evil on Sunday in my sermon, but it, it was just so clear. Yeah. And on the other hand, it was just so shocking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what a week, right? I know evil all these things i mean hearing your the way that you, the definition of that made me really think about how we so we had evil. a we had a funeral of, for a beloved church member and board chair this week we had a sermon on evil and we had a lesson tonight on um on uh satan and then we had this morning we were looking at the beatitudes and the sermon on the mount and the sermon on the plain in luke and Oh, and Matthew, and it was, I mean, it's been a, it's been a, a tight week. And here's the other part is my charge conference papers are due in tomorrow. <laughs> when was I supposed to oh, do that? Lord, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And I couldn't, I have been trying to get into my, uh, email, um, for some reason, the password to get into data services has changed. You know, and it just, it's just a nightmare. The good news is, is that David and I have the numbers. I just need to get in there and punch them in. It won't take me 30 minutes, but I got, you know, mm -hmm. I've got some other things I'll have to like email to them as an attachment as a PDF, but I've already got those ready. So, I mean, it's not like I have to, I have to start from scratch. I've got what I need. I just need to get into data services. And this is all going on at the same time that of Donna's illness and passing. And, um, and this crazy sermon and study this week. Yeah. Becky, um, Did you try the password six six six. <laughs> Let's not go there, Jean. <laughs> Becky Martino and San by the way, Sandra, thank you about the pearls. I'm glad you love them. Becky Martino has a question that Becky is, is she in the bedroom or is she hiding over there next to you? She's in the bedroom. Okay, so she says I think that most people really don't want to be educated. They want to con they want to convince you to think like them. I guess you have to sneak education up on them. Mm. Well, Becky, mm. a li it's a it's a little bit cynical, but it has a little bit of truth too. Mm. I think we're resistant when something we cherish or value or assumed was unassailable suddenly collapses. And I think a lot of people are worried that if one thing's collapse collapses, then the whole the whole house is going to come down. Like if if the name Satan is not in the Bible, then then uh, somehow Jesus didn't exist and it's all a lie. Yeah, and your whole theology collapses. See, if your theology collapses because you, <laughs> you've translated one word incorrectly, and then your your faith wasn't very sturdy yeah, to begin yeah, with. Yeah, but what if what if one's theology is built on these certain words? I mean, I, I'm agreeing with you. But I'm saying there are some that it's built on that. And so if you say, to, if you say like when I first met you and heard all of this and I thought, what nonsense? What, you, are you crazy? You know, this is my theology. And if you, if yours, what you're saying is true, then everything is going to crumble because, yeah, it didn't make sense. And so it's like, uh, 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 no, 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 I'm, I'm holding on to this. I'm not going anywhere. But I it's think, not... I mean, I could be wrong. I think you were okay with it because you saw I was okay. You said, okay, Bert's standing somewhere where he loves Jesus, but he's telling me these, this is really about the details. Hmm. You know, this is about the theology. This is about the words. 
It's about what we, you know, what the scriptures say as opposed to what traditions say. All I was doing was putting a spotlight on the difference between the scriptures and the traditions. And they don't agree a lot. No. In evangelical theology and sometimes not in other theologies. Ever. No. And to, I think, to hearing it over and over. It's like, not just one. So I had to, I heard that and I just. So I, I was Young's literal translation. I was one out of 24. Mm-hmm. And it's hard, it's hard to vote for the one out of 24. And I immediately rejected it initially. I, I, I immediately just rejected it. And I heard it again, and went, okay, well, let me listen again. Let me listen further. Let me listen deeper. Um, you know, and in time and time and time after time, hearing it and then seeing it and asking the questions um, made a little bit more sense and a little bit more sense and a little bit more sense. But it was like, I think for most people, it's like, you're not going to ruin my theology. This is what I, I grew up on. This is the only thing that I know. And you, if you take this away, I have nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like when I discovered CPE, I'm like, uh -uh, you're not going to take away my Jesus. I don't know where you're going with this nonsense. You're not going to take away my didn't. Because that's, that's what I thought. To care for people of different faith, I had to lose me and what I had. And that was not true. Mm -mm. Um, I gain more. I, I am still the same who I, person who I am, but I just learn how to be with a Muslim and how I can be with a Jew, Jewish person and a Baha'i and whomever, whatever traditions. And I think you learned how to learn. You just got open. Yeah. I think, you know, indoctrinating mm -hmm. someone is really different from educating. And, you know, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, Ed education um, leads people to re to reflection and, and self understanding, and indoctrination just m mm -hmm. makes them memorize what you tell them to. Mm -hmm. The reflection is is a, is a key piece that you mentioned. Reflection. Yes. Yeah, so learning how to reflect, of, learning yes. how to think critically about things is a is a skill. Um, it may be right now it's becoming a lost skill because there's a lot of indoctrinating going in, on in universities and colleges right now that wasn't going on when I was there. Yeah. And um, I don't know where we are with that. But indoctrination is not my friend, and it's not your friend either. St. Paul used to use the word a lot, um, my seminary, praxis. Yes. Which is basically action reflection. Mm-hmm. Most people have action reaction. Yes. Okay, what's the, let's let's go over that. Okay, so the difference between action reflection and action reaction. Talk talk about that, Gene. You 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 take it in, you internalize it, you process it, you let it soak into you, you soak in it for a while, and then see how it fits and feels. You know, um, an untruth repeated is still untrue, no matter how loudly you repeat it. <laughs> You know, we, uh, we've all heard, I don't know if we all have or not, but we've all heard things about people of other genders, other races, other orientations, you know, and if you just keep saying it long enough, some people believe it, but it doesn't make it true. Yeah. And if you just shout it, mm -hmm. because you want to be more right than you believe you are. Yeah. You yeah. So, <laughs> so, so uh, a, a reaction, so if you say something, mm. If you say something and I say to myself, well, I'll never trust him again, yeah. that's a reaction. Because yeah. you might be telling me the truth. I don't know because I'm refusing to reflect on it or explore it. And you'll never know. And then I'll never know, but I won't ever trust you again. Just because you said something that didn't agree with what I'd always heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's... People walk out of a class, a group. A session a church and never even had the common courtesy to come back and say did you say what i think you said and why did you say it why do you believe it mm -hmm. or even even have an argument about yeah it. Or why, and, from. and none of us agree on everything so how come how come mm -hmm. how come disagreeing on one matter becomes the litmus test for whether i'm going to give you the time of day or not mm -hmm. i think you named it earlier with maturity People that are open and want to grow, you don't always agree. I mean, and it's okay. It's really okay not to agree. And I had to come to terms with that because I thought, you know, I wanted everybody to like me and I wanted everyone to 
you know, believe what I was saying and, and all of that. And it's like, no, I mean, we're different and we think differently. And so you can think for yourself and we can agree to disagree. And, it, and it's really okay. Yeah. So I think it comes with growth and maturity. I, so, I, that, I really believe that. So I had this, I had this group over in Israel that was predominantly, um, just average Methodist Episcopal type people, but there was a group within the group that was evangelical. And um, one, one, of the, one of the people on the bus said to me privately, was like, I just can't stand those people. I said, why? And he said, I mean, they just stand for everything I disagree with. And uh, I said, well, I love them. He said, well, how can you love them? They're just wrong about everything. <laughs> mm. And I said, well, mainly because I believe, I really believe in inclusiveness. And if you're going to be intolerant toward people that you think are wrong, you're not being inclusive. And that's not mature, you know? And that's sort of what I try to live by, is being... Tolerant of even the people that I have trouble being tolerant of them. You know, in, in, in this person's case, <laughs> the Christian evangelicals that were on the bus with him, that he decided, you know, that he just hated. That doesn't sound Christian to me. No. Even the Gentiles, dot, dot, dot. Mm. Dot, dot, dot. The Gentiles. Yeah. The nations. Pull down the sheet. <laughs> on the rooftop well it's 741 y'all maybe we should wrap up anything from you Kia you out there yeah, I, well one of the things that I was just thinking about was that you know ignorance is bliss you know, <laughs> for those that don't know sometimes they want to stew in the I don't know mm -hmm. and that's where they that's where they stay and is and I was also thinking of around the traditional you know, one of the things that I thought about when you started talking about it is we may have a kind of engulfed ourselves into a tradition, not even really understanding the foundation of where that tradition started. Mm -hmm. Because all of, all of what we're hearing and learning and, and kind of embracing tonight and just understanding that Satan is not proper, no pun intended with that. <laughs> in in more ways than one, right? Yeah, exactly. But with Satan not being proper, um, where did it stem from? You know, with it with it being a traditional stance, who's to say, you know, when we take that on and take that into our spirit, that somebody who translated the Bible got it right? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, when she was saying that, Gene, I was thinking about how um, a lot of uh, Pentecostals, for example, for them, their their understanding of, of Scripture and theology probably doesn't go past much farther back than the late 19th century dispensationalism and millennialism that was uh, a part of the creation of the Pentecostal movement. And... Um, and uh, and because of that, they're sort of like orphans. They 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 think they're the ones who have all of these things right, but they have no idea that they are the great 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 grandchildren, and they need to go back and look a little farther back than 1890. Yeah, yeah. The world is older than 6,000 years. And honor their foreparents that they may stay in the land a long time. Yeah, and be blessed. Yeah. You get a, you get a group that says, we want to sing the old hymns. So we sang a Gregorian chant one Sunday. That was not what they had in mind. Or they didn't and like the, they don't like the 13th the century? No 14th century music, huh? <laughs> Athanasius was, was right out the window. That's too bad. Oh, Lord. Yeah, don't get far, far home, and what are you going to do? Yeah, and I can't tell the difference between what they mean when they say old-timey hymns, too, because the old-timey hymns tend to have been written about 100, 150 years ago, but John Wesley and Charles Wesley's hymns go back farther than that, so which one's the old-timey one? Yeah. Yeah. Cokesbury. <laughs> yeah, Cokesbury. <laughs> and I love the Cokesbury hymns, and I know them by heart. Mm -hmm. 153, Love, Mercy, and Grace, I think. 
I know some of the numbers. And I knew the Baptist hymnal too, word for word, all six verses of all those hymns. I mean, word for word. Didn't, even, didn't even have to open your hymnal? N knew the numbers, knew, no, didn't need the hymnal. Oh, wow. Hymnal. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, we learned. See, in Baptist too, as I, where I grew up, we learned memory verses. So I can quote scriptures to you from Genesis to Revelation. The 66 books of the Bible, we learned it from you we three or four years old. Every, every child can repeat it, I mean, without missing. Yeah. So we memorize a lot of scriptures. So we memorize songs. We memorize everything. Because, I mean, we believe in high church too, you know, and, and, but when we get up there and then you get a clap for, you know, your child and you say your speech correctly and, you know, and oh yeah, I mean, we go to town with that, but memor memorizing stuff was, was number one key and I haven't forgotten it's still there. So I can, so that kind of, that's sort of like the difference between deductive and inductive learning yeah. too. Yes. Um, so deductive would be sort of memorization, rote, alphabetizing, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And inductive would be um, through story and meaning. Even today, I, if I need to remember something, I acronize, acronize it. It's like I put an acronym on it. Sure. So I'll remember, it, it's like, it's a short, memorization quick way. Trip. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can do that really well. And so it's. I, I told Jean Still the bad really joke that I, t that I say to you sometimes. Which one? Because you're a good Baptist and everything. And so I, I told him what I said to you one time. I said, well, you know, the joke is that the, the, the Baptists can quote you the scriptures, but the Methodists know what they mean. <laughs> That's not funny anymore. Yeah, I know. You told me that wasn't funny the first time I told you. <laughs> She's very laughing now. Well, she get, lets me I'm get away. At the joke. She lets me get away with it because I love her, and because my grandmother was Baptist and my mother was raised Baptist, so it's it's in my blood. It got better though. <laughs> going on to perfection. That's right, going on to Wesley's perfection. <laughs> I think. Oh, Jane, thank you so much for being here tonight, and. Uh, it's a blessing, man, to have you here. I hope that uh, Dale will be able to come back soon. And I miss Sheila tonight. And you know, she said she was going to be up for two weeks. So yeah, I saw on the, on Facebook that she's still roaming around. I think she's out somewhere traveling. Yeah, she's out and about. Gene, let me ask you this one question before we go. So the Beatitudes, do you say blessed or blessed? Or what do you what do you say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed. This morning he said blessed. Blessed. We say blessed. <laughs> And, and that's cool. I don't have any problem with it. You know, I lived part of my year in the uh, Middle Ages doing Renaissance Festival, and that's the way it would have been pronounced then. But the point being, it's it's uh, it's a present tense reality. Mm -hmm. you, you are blessed right now. Gotcha. You know, Jesus you. uses present tense and in no the whole waiting. thing. Yeah. People for two, no waiting. Blessed. It's real. Blessed you are. Now and here. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. That's For the true. kingdom of heaven is theirs. Yes. Yeah, yes. we focused on the present yes. tense. It almost sounds past tense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so folks, you. Uh, Gene's study on Wednesdays um, is at 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central. So you can go to that anytime. And I always send something out to remind you all about that. Please join us on Zoom or on Facebook at Gene Martino Jr.'s uh, Facebook page. And uh, he starts usually a few minutes early. And um, come back next week and we will look at Ha Diabolos, the slanderer. Mistranslated probably as the devil. We're probably going to find the same thing. It's Because it's always the Diabolos. This time I'm putting $100 down. Oh, no, you better not. You better not. <laughs> Am I going to lose And it? we'll do that next week. And we'll look forward to seeing you all on Sundays too. So at 10 o'clock um, our time Eastern. We'll have Owl Rock service. That's 9 o'clock uh, Central for Gene. And then your, tell us about your times and stuff, Gene. Uh, our service would be at uh, 11 o'clock your time, 10 o'clock our time. Excellent. You can go to both or neither or whatever the Lord leads you to do. But yep. we'll be right here. Yep. We'll be right here uh, sharing the scriptures, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, a string of pearls. And a, and a string of pearls in the Atlanta Braves, which we're probably going to try to watch without having a heart attack. 
Yeah, I'm going to try to make a jean. Uh, it's hard uh, to get away while I'm at work. It's just so yeah, hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes yeah. I lock my door and I get interrupted <laughs> in meetings all the time. But yeah, I want to be there. I really want to come. Bert, Bert talks yeah. about it all the I time. I mean, it's such a great study and, yeah. and I appreciate him letting me jabber every once in a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. Becky, yeah. it's so good to see you and Sandra and Carolyn. Um, hey, Carolyn, yes. thanks for coming. Hey, Sandra. Sure, Becky, love you so much. Thank you for sharing your husband with us. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's sending kisses. Uh, <laughs> kisses, kisses, kisses. Y'all have a great evening. Bye, Kia. I'm going to go turn this thing off. Love y'all. You got to get a sock over there. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kia. Bye-bye.